webinar, How to Plan for the Possibility that Your Pets Might Outlive You. This is Jennifer Kashnick. I'm with the Gray Muzzle Organization. And we are here today with Amy Sheever. She was with the Second Chance for Pets Organization. And she's here to give this presentation. So welcome, everyone. Um, Amy, would you mind telling everybody a little bit about yourself? And then we'll get started. Sure. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you so much for inviting our organization to present some information to your group. We're very excited about getting the message out and helping pet owners understand how to plan for the possibility that their pets might outlive them. So um, I, am, I volunteer as the director of Second Chance for Pets. Uh, we got things started off in 2003. Um, myself and most of our volunteers have come from backgrounds of doing rescue work. And personally, I was not just a foster failure, but I <laughs> just was not cut out for volunteering in shelters. And so I found a different calling. And um, we are an advocacy group. And I'm going to give you some information about what our group does and all the resources that we provide. Um, most of our volunteers also work. I work full time in the high tech industry and um, really enjoy being able to get our message and information out to pet owners. We also work very closely with animal rescue groups um, and veterinarians as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to discuss over the next 45 minutes or so is I'm going to give a little bit of information about the background about the issue of pets outliving their owners. I'm going to give a couple of provide a couple of slides about emergency planning as it relates to lifetime care planning. And lifetime care planning basically means making sure that you have a plan in place so that if anything should happen to you, whether it's an emergency situation or something permanently happens, that your pets will always receive care. And we have a ton of resources. I'm going to point some of these resources out to you. Um, but keep in mind that we have all of our resources on our website, secondchanceforpets.org. Uh, we have quite a few archived newsletters. We've got a ton of content. Uh, we've got workbooks that I'm going to mention uh, during today's webinar. We also have what are called emergency ID cards. So if you get a chance, take a look at our website. Um, take a look at the resources section where we have, again, a, quite a bit of information that will be helpful to you. Um, and we're constantly updating our website as well. So I've got a couple of questions that I think will resonate uh, with you as a responsible pet owner. And the first one, and I think that the main reason that you're here today, is to understand you know, what's going to happen to your pets if anything happens to you. So basically, um, you know, we all worry about our pets and their lives today and making sure that we're giving them the right love and care. But if anything should ever happen to us, who is going to continue that care and continue to provide the love and all the wonderful things that we do for our pets? And being a responsible pet owner, you most likely have relatives and friends who may have not had the conversation with you, but if they were ever posed with a question about, who would take over the care of their pets, those chances are they may, be, they may have you in mind as that backup caregiver. And then, of course, knowing that you're the responsible pet owner in the neighborhood, um, I'm sure a lot of your neighbors assume that you know, if anything should happen to them, that you would not let anything happen to their pets. So a little bit about our organization. We're an all virtual volunteer group. And that means that we have volunteers all over the country. We have um, volunteers in different parts of the world as well. And um, again, we all volunteer to help make a difference in the lives of pets. And a lot of our volunteers help with web research. Uh, they also um, help with writing and editing. Um, we participate at a number of animal welfare conferences and veterinary conferences throughout the year. And as you, when you, once you get a chance to see our website, you'll see that, we, again, we have a lot of different content, newsletters, and resources that we constantly update to make sure that we have 
helpful and comprehensive information for pet owners. So the big question here is what happens to orphan pets? So when I was volunteering at an um, animal shelter in Northern California, um, one of the things that really was disturbing is when someone came in and said, oh, you know, my parent just passed away and I'm dealing with his uh, funeral or trying to figure out, you know, what to do with his house, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and by the way, here's his pets. And what I found out very quickly is that these are not your typical stray cats and stray dogs off the street. These are pets who have sat on people's laps and lived in their homes and slept in their beds. And so it wasn't like they were starving for food uh, or starving for attention. And the shelter environment was often very scary for pets who all of a sudden had no human caregivers. And what typically happens is these animals become despondent and they don't eat. And as you know, in very crowded shelters, um, when a pet is labeled unadoptable, then they're also the first pets to be uh, euthanized in the shelter. So having volunteered in the shelter environment for several years, um, I kept on thinking to myself that maybe this issue of pets outliving their owners was really just an old person's issue. And then September 11, 2001 happened, and I, and I soon was, I was reading the um, articles about all the animals that had, left be, that had been left behind when their pet owners passed away. And the average age of the pet owner who passed away was in their 30s, and that's when I realized that this is not just an issue for somebody who's really old who may end up going to a nursing home or passing away, but this is an issue that every responsible pet owner needs to think about. And I certainly thought about it, and I realized that I didn't really understand what my options were and what were the things that I needed to do um, to make sure that nothing would ever happen to my pets if anything happened to me. And then another issue that I came to understand very quickly is not just cats and dogs, but there are a lot of animals that have very long lifespans, such as birds and horses. And on this slide, I introduce you to Lucy, who um, will be living probably to 75 or 80, um, and who most likely will outlive her current human companion. And for anybody out there who has thought about adopting a bird or who has a bird as part of their family, you realize that these are really intelligent creatures, um, that a lot of times they will bond with their human. And unfortunately, when they do outlive their humans, a lot of times they go into homes um, with relatives who really don't understand the care requirements of a bird or they really don't want to have a bird. So unfortunately for a lot of birds, especially in the U.S., um, they end up in pretty bad situations. Um, there are some really great animal sanctuaries out there that take birds, but there's just not enough of them. So again, if you're thinking about adopting a bird or if you have a bird as part of your family, this is a really important issue to think about is, you know, who is going to take over the care of your bird should anything ever happen to you. So here's one of our volunteers. He's a really wonderful person. His name is Ken, and Ken only adopts older pets. And here are two pets that he um, adopted. One is Buffy and one is Willie. And Buffy is the little black dog who is blind. And what happened with Willie's, I'm sorry, Buffy's owner, is that Buffy had, um, Buffy's owner had passed away and basically had said to his family, hey, I don't really care what you do with my home. I don't care what you do with my cars, my money. I just want to make sure that you take care of Buffy. And for several months, Buffy lived in his home alone. And of course, you know, he's blind and used to a lot of human companionship, so it wasn't an ideal situation. Um, one of the sons or daughters would come by once a day and give him some food. But eventually, Ken found out about Buffy and, and then adopted Buffy. Um, with Willie, 
Willie had an interesting situation in that Willie had all kinds of health issues. And so, of course, his human um, made it very clear to his um, children that if anything should happen, to make sure that Willie was the top priority. And unfortunately, Willie also lived in his home for many months until a home could be found for him. But luckily for Willie, Ken also adopted Willie. So both of these dogs ended up in a very, very good situation. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen that often. And if you remember back to the slide about the animals that go into the shelter and they become despondent, um, unfortunately, that's very typical. And for those of you who have been in a shelter, you realize that when you walk into a shelter and you go up and down and you see all these animals in cages, you don't necessarily know which of these dogs came from these kinds of situations. And it's, you know, it's a very tragic situation. And again, it's one reason to do everything possible while you're here to make sure that your pets never end up at the shelter. So a lot of you are familiar with the tragic numbers of how many animals are euthanized in shelters every year. And it's something that has actually improved over time thanks to spay and neuter. But still, there's just so many animals that are still entering into shelters every year and unfortunately euthanized a lot of times because of lack of space in the animal shelters. And there's over 500,000 pets every year that enter shelters simply because they've outlived their owners. And our organization really believes that this is a preventable issue, that we all as responsible pet owners, not only can we do something to make sure our animals uh, don't end up at the shelter, but we can also make sure to educate the people that we love with pets, our friends, our relatives, uh, people in our community. Um, this is a really simple thing that we can do to help address the overpopulation issue. So one of the things our group does when we start talking to other organizations, um, we speak to a lot of senior groups. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we talk to animal welfare organizations. We talk to veterinarians. Is we start the conversation by talking about emergency planning. And I think everybody can relate in some way to emergency planning, whether you live in an area that um, gets fires or floods or hurricanes. There's always some kind of natural disaster where you have to think about having an emergency plan. And so we have some tools on our website. We have emergency ID cards um, that you can print for free. Uh, you can put them in your wallet, you can put them in your car, you can put them in, um, we encourage people to put them in their doorways, on their refrigerators. So if should, anything should ever happen in case of an emergency, people know that you have animals in your home, they know where to locate leashes and supplies, and they know, most importantly, who they can contact, who can take over the care of the pets, should you be in a situation where you can't get home to take care of them yourself. So a couple of things to think about for emergency planning is to have a kit ready to go. Um, for, for those of you who may be in California where if an earthquake hits, you really don't have days to put something together. You have to be ready to get out of your house immediately. So it's a good idea to think about planning a kit um, having at least two weeks of supplies available in that kit so that, again, if something should happen, you can take your pets, take your kit, and get out of your home. Um, it's also important to think about where you could take your pets. And in light of the um, hurricanes that happened over the past several years, there are a large number of shelters now available that will take in you and your pets but you do have to bring with you proof of records, of shots. Um, sometimes they ask for proof of ownership of your pets or adoption certificates. Um, so again, it's things that you have to plan in advance. And the most important thing of all of this is to make sure that you have two forms of identification. Um, this is for dogs, for cats, 
and also for birds. Um, having a microchip and a tag with current information is really, really important. And the reason I say having both forms of ID is because typical in an emergency situation, cats and dogs may lose their collars and their tags come off. So having those microchips um, in part of your pets will help in making sure that if your pets ever get separated from you, that they will find you. So here is a, a quick checklist um, for things that you can have in your um, emergency kit. And um, we will have this posted on our website, and Gray Muzzle will also have those slides posted on their website, so you don't have to take furious notes during the webinar. Um, but all this is available. I know that a lot of organizations have pet emergency checklists now. So it's all a matter of just really determining what you personally will need for your pets for at least two weeks. And then we're going to talk about what I call lifetime care options. Again, making sure that if anything should happen to you, that your pets will always receive love and care. The most important thing of a lifetime care option is making sure that you have caregivers that are 100% committed to taking over the care of your pets. And if you notice in all of the slides that I have, the only thing in red is the word caregivers, because that really, really is the most critical component to having a good plan for your pets. It's also the most difficult thing to think about, because a lot of people assume that their sons or their daughters or somebody in their family or a neighbor would automatically take over the care of the pets. And unfortunately, that is not always the situation. And I'm sure if you talk to people in the rescue community, one of the things that's so tragic is when they get approached by somebody's children who say, hey, my parents just passed away, or my dad's ill, he's in hospice, and here's his pet. <laughs> um, and also, the other situation is where people actually have a, a will or trust, which we're going to talk about in just a couple of minutes. and they have listed their sons or daughters as the backup caregivers for their pets. Unfortunately, they never had the conversation with them, or they never really got the commitment from their sons or daughters to take over the care of the pets. And so it's really, again, really critical to make sure that you have these conversations with people, no matter how difficult it is, and make sure that they are completely on board to taking over the care of your pets if anything should ever happen to you. The second really important piece here is having your instructions in writing. Obviously, if something should happen in case of an emergency or something worse, your pets cannot provide the information about where their food is, if any of them are on medication, if they have any behavioral habits, if they're afraid of lightning, when they go on walks, all of those things are really important to document and to have these available so in case of an emergency, again, or if anything should happen to you, that your pets will receive the same kind of care that you're giving them now. So we have on our website a care instructions workbook that you can download and print for free. And you basically just fill it out and hand it over to uh, your caregivers, you can give copies to uh, your dog walkers, your pet setters, and we also encourage people to give a copy to your veterinarian as well. And the third important part of any good lifetime care program for your pets is having a finance plan. And I'm going to give you some, talked about a couple of different options, but this is something else a lot of people don't think about. But it's important to realize that if somebody should take over the care of your pets, that they will also be responsible for taking over the care and paying for anything related to that care. So again, the most important piece of this entire presentation is the caregiver piece. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll, by the end of this presentation, I'll sound like a broken record. But it's really, really important to, again, have a committed caregiver or more than one. Um, 
I encourage people to have the conversation with their pet sitters, um, with their groomers, people in the pet industry, um, people that you meet in the dog park. I know that we all know their dog's names, <laughs> but if you have a conversation with them, and it could be as simple as, hey, if anything should ever happen to you, I will take over the care of your pets, and if anything should happen to me, would you take over the care of my pets? And ha start having those conversations with people so that you can identify the right people that you know would be the right committed caregivers. Um, vet techs and vet students are also possibilities. Again, talk with your friends and relatives and neighbors. Don't just assume that your daughter or son will automatically take over the care of your pets, because a lot of times that does not happen. And the other thing I always recommend to people is having that conversation, making sure you have committed caregivers, and check back with them every few years. Because people's lives change. Um, the people that you have designated as caregivers a few years from now, they may have a lot of pets. They may not be able to be in the position to take over the care of anyone else's pets. Or they already have a bunch of children. <laughs> so it's really important, again, to initially have those conversations. But again, checking back with those committed caregivers every few years. And if you don't have caregivers, the end result could be that a complete stranger, some such as somebody who comes into your home from animal care and control, they will be making the decisions about your pet's future. So written instructions, I uh, mentioned that we have the Pet Care Instructions Workbook on our website. Um, I encourage you again to you know, fill those out, give caregivers copies. Also make sure you have them in an, a location where people can easily find them. If they're in your basement or in a file cabinet, um, that's not going to be very helpful, especially in an emergency situation. Also, make sure you keep your instructions up to date. So if your medications change for your pets or their diets change, um, all, those information, all that information needs to be kept up to date. So the big question a lot of people um, have a have struggled with is the financial planning part. The good news is that if you have a life insurance policy, um, if it's named to a human beneficiary, the best thing to do is have a conversation with whoever that human beneficiary is. Make sure that they are committed to taking over the financial responsibility for the pets. So if you have somebody who's designated as the caregiver, that person needs to know that Here's the human beneficiary of the life insurance policy that will make sure that the cost of the care of the pets is being covered. So that's really one of the easiest things to do. Um, if you're really concerned about financial planning or how to set up a, a fund or set aside funds, um, I always recommend talking to a financial planner or your attorney. Um, and it's also important to justify the amount that you leave aside. So if you do set up a fund, think about the life expectancy of your pets, how long they're going to live, how much you spend every year, um, take into consideration how much you might need to leave aside for emergencies, um, pet insurance, and of course how the cost for pets increase as they age. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some legal options and some other options that go above and beyond just having caregivers and written instructions. Um, so I'm going to give you some information about wills and estate plans and pet trusts. I'm also going to introduce you to the concept of the animal care panel. And I'm going to give some information about perpetual care programs and small sanctuaries. So wills and estate plans um, are really great for people, again, who are going to keep them updated, um, who, again, have committed caregivers that they can name in their wills and estate plans. Um, one of the issues with wills and estate plans is that a very small number of Americans will create them. And those that do create a will or estate plan, 
they typically don't update, update them except for every 19 years. So what concerns me about that is that, number one, they're not making sure that the pet information is updated and they're not updating the caregiver information. So if you do go the route of having a will or an estate plan, again, make sure that you update them frequently, make sure that the pet information is kept current, and make sure that the caregiver information is kept current. Um, and if you do think that you're going to have children fighting over your will or estate plan, um, make sure you get a really good lawyer because the worst thing that can happen is have the pets in jeopardy having to be put in a kennel while people fight over your will or an estate plan. So pet trusts are another um, really interesting option for people who are considering doing something legal to ensure that their pets will always receive care. Um, and the good news is that the majority of states have a statute or a pet trust law in place. Um, unfortunately, very few lawyers specialize in pet trusts, and I'm going to provide some contact information at the end of the presentation for some of the lawyers who do specialize in pet trusts. So if you do have an estate planner that you've been working with, you can refer them to um, a lawyer who specializes in pet trusts. And so what is different about a pet trust versus a will or an estate plan? The pet trust actually only addresses how you want your pets taken care of. Everything from do you want your pet buried or cremated when your pet passes away, um, who should be making the decisions about euthanasia, um, all those details would go into a pet trust. So um, if more people had pet trusts, I think a lot of these animals who do outlive their pets would have a much better life. So it's definitely something to explore. And again, there are people out there that can help you and your estate planner um, put together a really solid pet trust. So the Animal Care Panel is another interesting legal option, and this is actually the one that um, we, myself and my husband, uh, choose for our pets. Um, the requirements are is that you own your own home and that ideally you don't have you know, family members who are going to contest your legal solutions that you've created. Um, it's a great option for people who have no caregivers in mind. Um, it's also a very good option for people who have a large number of pets, um, who have pets that have special needs, um, they want their pets to remain together in their own home. Even people who have animals that they feel that would be very, very difficult to place or to adopt into another home. This is definitely something to consider. And how it works is you have a lawyer, and there are several lawyers out there that will that have a template for animal care panel, uh, they will work with you to draft the uh, legal paperwork up. It's not very complicated. But you would select somebody that could live in your home and take care of your pets if anything should happen to you. And you might also have um, an estate planner or financial planner or a trustee that manages all the financial parts of this. So for example, they, would, they might take your life insurance policy and your remaining funds and take care of everything related to your house and take care of everything related to the financial responsibility for caring for your pets. Um, so the person that lives in your house with your pets would not have to worry about all of those other things. I also recommend that you consider having somebody um, that's part of your local animal welfare community as part of your panel and possibly even a veterinarian. And the reason I say this is um, because what you can do is you can um, delegate that once all of your pets have passed away that the remaining funds could go to a local animal welfare organization. So if you have somebody from an animal welfare group that's part of the panel that's helping 
monitor the situation with your pets, making sure that everything's being cared for, that, again, they will have um, a, a really good reason to have a vested interest in um, making sure your pets are always being taken care of. So perpetual care programs are also fairly new. Um, there are several um, universities that have perpetual care programs. And how these work is that you leave a, um, a fund aside for your pets. Um, it's probably like a deposit of somewhere around two to $5,000. And this basically just enrolls your pets so that if something should happen to you, your pets could enter their program. Now, if you do pass away, then part of your estate would be designated to covering the cost of your lifetime care of your pets in these programs. Um, and these programs can be very costly. They can cost anywhere from $25,000 up to $200,000 per pet. Um, some of these programs offer really great environments for pets where there's 24 by 7 care. Um, these pets live in a home environment. And then some of these facilities are just that. They're just a facility with kennels. So they may not be a really great em environment for your pets to live out the rest of your lives. Um, but the, the real benefit here is that if you do not have caregivers, that these might be good options to consider. Um, we have an evaluation form that I'm going to reference. And I always suggest if you're considering this option is to physically inspect the facility or the program. Again, make sure it's the right place that your pets could live out the rest of their lives. And as we all know, there's lots and lots of animal sanctuaries that exist. And typically, they're created by people that are very well-meaning. Uh, they take in lots and lots of animals who you know, otherwise would not have a place to go. Um, but a lot of times, they're not financially sustainable, which is an issue. And then the other issue is that if anything should happen to the people that are running the sanctuary, then a lot of times those pets' lives are in jeopardy. Uh, we're going to begin a program in 2014 where we're working closely with reputable sanctuaries so that we can help refer pet owners to sanctuaries. Um, we also have on our website, on the resources section, we maintain lists by region of sanctuaries. Um, of course, we can't go out and inspect the sanctuaries, and we can't evaluate them. But we provide the information so that you can understand which sanctuaries, um, what they do, where they exist, um, what their fees are, and their contact information. But we really recommend that you evaluate this option, just like the perpetual care programs, making sure that this is the right solution for your pets. So I mentioned we have an evaluation form. And this is, again, on our website. So I'm not going to go through all these questions. But it's very, very important that if you go and you're looking at a sanctuary or perpetual care program to you know, have a very detailed conversation with the people that are running the program. Um, you know, if there's 300 animals and only two people there, then chances are your pet is not likely going to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. Uh, chances are they won't get special diets, and they won't get a lot of exercise. So there's a lot of things that you need to think about before you make the decision that a perpetual care program or a sanctuary is the right place for your pets. So I'm going to just highlight a couple of things to think about. Um, we've talked a lot about emergency planning and all the different options for pets. Um, but what are some of the things that we all can be doing to making a difference in, with ourselves, with our families, and in our communities? Um, again, for your own pets, make sure that you have a plan in place. And at a minimum, make sure that you have a committed caregiver to take over the care of your pets, should that ever be necessary. Um, and my mantra is that if every responsible pet owner had a committed caregiver, then thousands and thousands of animals would not enter the shelters every year. 
and so many more lives would be saved. Um, you're probably familiar with some of the local rescue groups in your area, but what you may not realize is that there's more than 12,500 rescue groups in the country. And most of these are volunteer grassroots organizations where they are spending all their resources and all their time taking over the care of the older pets, of the special needs pets, of the pets that just need to get out of the shelter when the shelters are full. And so I, I highly encourage you to, you know, really support them. And when you see them out in front of Petco or PetSmart, um, when you see them doing fundraisers in your communities, um, make sure to, you know, have conversations with them too. They are a good resource and several of them might even work out arrangements to take over the care of your pets. They might have uh, caregivers that can come in your home um, and take care over the care of your pets, such as in the um, animal care panel. Um, they may be able to foster your pets in case of an emergency. Um, but again, a lot of these groups are really well-run organizations, um, very dedicated, passionate volunteers. And uh, without these groups, we would have a lot more animals, thousands and thousands of more animals entering into shelters every year. We also encourage people to adopt from shelters and rescue groups. What you may not know is that only 20% of companion animals that are in homes today come from shelters. So if we can encourage more people to adopt versus purchase from breeders, especially backyard breeders and um, puppy mills, um, we may be able to end this overpopulation issue. <laughs> That's what I'm convinced of. So again, if you're thinking about adding a dog or cat or bird to your family, check the rescue groups and check with the shelters and encourage other people to do the same. And again, spay and neuter programs are so critical to ending pet overpopulation. And there's a lot of low-cost programs that exist. And I've listed a link here that you can share with others who may be looking for a low-cost spay and neuter program. Also involving your local veterinarians um, makes a huge impact. And the reason I'm talking about veterinarians is twofold. If you have a conversation with any of your veterinarians, you will find that they have come across this issue many, many times where they're They've taken care of someone's cat or dog all their life. Suddenly, the um, pet owner ends up at a nursing home or passes away. And of course, this veterinarian is not going to euthanize this pet. Um, but we all know how difficult it is to rehome a pet. So <laughs> chances are they're, they take in these pets. Somebody on the staff takes over the care of the pets. So this is a really important issue for them. They're very responsive to working with us. Um, we have over 500,000 brochures in vet clinics today. And the second reason that we really focus on the veterinarian community is because they really are linked to responsible pet owners. And if we can provide the education directly to veterinarians and they can pass that on directly to their pet owner clients, then we really have a fighting chance of helping people understand how to plan for their pets. And if you really want to take another step forward in um, getting the word out, uh, we have slides that are available. We have brochures. We have emergency cards printed. And if you'd like to go into your own communities, uh, deliver workshops to senior centers, uh, work with the local animal rescue and shelter groups, um, people are very responsive to this topic. And um, again, it's, it's such an easy way to um, help make an impact on pet overpopulation. And if you do um, decide to hold workshops in your own communities, it's a great way to promote homeless pets and match them with new families. Um, so think about that. And if you're interested in getting any of our materials or slides, uh, please do contact us. And we'd be happy to help you in your own communities put your own workshops together. Um, as I mentioned, we go to a lot of senior groups and talk to them. And um, 
seniors in particular are an audience that we really want them to be able to have pets. And of course, a lot of seniors are concerned that you know, if anything should ever happen to them, what's going to happen to their pets? And one of the things that we work closely with the animal shelter and rescue community on is to make sure that when a pet is adopted, that they have a plan in place. So they help those seniors understand um, who would take over the care of the pets, whether the pet could go back to the rescue or the shelter group, and then find another home. But these are important questions to address uh, with seniors. And this slide I put up is um, it's a, a slide that resonates with a lot of the senior community when we go and meet with seniors. Um, because they do want to have pets, and pets are keep them company, and they're, they're family members. So um, the more that we can do to help seniors in the community to keep pets in their home, to adopt the right appropriate aged pets um, that will keep them company, um, but at the same time making sure that they have a plan for their pets, uh, then it's a win-win for all of us. There are some really great programs for, um, for seniors that are out there that we work with closely. Banfield has a peace of mind program where they help um, hospice patients with their pets. And then there's also Rebecca's Rainbow in Washington. And they uh, focus on helping people that um, are critically ill or who have other health issues making sure that their pets are being cared for and making sure that their pets will always receive care no matter what happens to the pet owner. And if you do get in a situation where you have to help rehome a pet, uh, we encourage you to um, have a real simple flyer created, give it to your veterinarians, get the word out there, uh, post the information on Facebook, um, and make sure you get the story about the pet out there. A lot of people are afraid of going to a shelter. So if you have um, these flyers out, um, you might want to think about putting them up at the uh, bulletin boards at Starbucks or your local grocery store or your library. And believe it or not, these flyers really, really do work. So um, again, if you do get in a situation where you need to rehome a pet, um, you know, think about the flyers and also enlist the help of your lo local rescue groups. So again, the ways that you can make a difference, um, you can also get our brochures out, again, to your veterinarians. Uh, we have, a, again, a ton of information on our website. You can submit articles to your local newspapers and your community newsletters. Talk to people that are involved in the animal shelter and rescue community. Um, our volunteers would always appreciate help connecting with veterinarian organizations, getting our information in veterinary publications. Um, and then understanding what organizations we can work with, just like Gray Muzzle, who can support the work that we do. So we have, again, a lot of information on the resources tab of our website. We do have presentation templates that can be customized um, that you can use in your own communities. Uh, we have quite a bit of articles. We have our, our emergency ID cards that you can print. Uh, we also have our pet care instructions workbook that is available on the front page of our website. We also have what are called door hanger emergency ID cards. And these can hang on your door so that if, in case of emergency, someone comes in, they automatically can see the emergency ID card with the information and instructions about your pets. And we have a presentation on our website that you can share. It's a very short, uh, I think it's two and a half minute video. So if you want to help get the word out, you can simply send our logo and our um, link to our website out to others, and they can then watch the quick presentation, which really creates awareness around this issue and also outlines the three components of a lifetime care plan, again, identifying caregivers, making sure you have written instructions, and setting up a finance plan. The next few slides that I'm going to just go through very quickly um, are for your reference. Uh, again, these are on our website. And again, the presentation will be posted to the Gray Muzzle um, website as well. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time but on these, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that this information existed. Um, our, here's the contact information for Peggy Hoyt, who's an estate planner in Florida. 
Uh, she's cr created quite a few animal care panels. She also has several books about pet trust. Uh, Jerry Beyer, who is a professor at law, has a lot of information on his website about pet trust and laws relating to planning for pets. Um, here's a few more tips about choosing a permanent caregiver. and entrusting a pet to an organization. So for example, um, whether or not to will your pet to um, a sanctuary, a perpetual care program. Sometimes local shelters will say, hey, you know, we'll take your pet should something happen to you. Um, but again, these are things that you should definitely look into and carefully consider before you sign up. And here's some sample language for a will. Having something in writing, again, is, is ideal. and I certainly recommend it, and especially if you think you might have family members that might contest um, your will or what you leave behind. Um, but again, the most important thing is making sure that nothing happens to your pets. Here's some limitations of a will, um, some differences between wills and trusts, and setting up a trust, powers of attorney, locating legal assistance. Um, and this is a really interesting one here. Called, it's requesting a pet to be euthanized upon a pet owner's death. And believe it or not, what happens is a lot of people think that there's no one else out there that can take better care of their pets so that the pets are better off being euthanized. And the good thing is most veterinarians will not do this because they understand that if a pet is healthy, if a pet is adoptable, then there should be no reason to euthanize a pet just because their owners pass away. And really what the red flag is here is that the pet owner doesn't understand that there are plenty of options for planning for the appropriate care of their pets should something happen to them. So I just wanted to bring that up because, um, again, this, is a, this does happen, unfortunately, and um, what I wanted to do is make sure that you understood that, again, there are all these different options, and so having a pet euthanized just because an owner passes away is really um, unnecessary. And then my final comments for today's webinar is creating awareness about this issue is, is really, really critical. And if you feel uncomfortable having conversations with other people about this topic, you know, just send them over our website, send them to the link of our short presentation. Um, you can give them our emergency ID cards. But, you know, helping create awareness in your community, again, with your people that you care about who have pets, um, is so important because a lot of people just don't think about this issue. Um, or for people who do think about this issue, they're not really sure um, what to do to make sure that their animals will always receive care. And you know, educating pet owners, um, whether, again, it's your friends or people you see at the dog park, um, this is going to really prevent animals from ending up at the shelters. And it's going to provide all of us with better peace of mind knowing that we are doing everything possible to make sure that our pets will always receive care. And here's our contact information. Um, as I mentioned, we're an all-volunteer group. Uh, we do our best to respond to emails uh, within 24 hours. We do um, check our emails frequently. If you can't remember our email address, you can go to our website and click on the Contact Us button. Um, but I encourage you to check out our website. There is a lot of information on there, particularly in the Resources tab where we have our list of sanctuaries. Uh, we have archives of newsletters and other helpful information for pet owners. Um, but if there's something that you think about particular to your situation, contact us and we'll do whatever we can to help you out. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time today. I want to thank the Gray Muzzle Foundation for giving us the opportunity to present this to you. Um, and we certainly appreciate your time and we appreciate your doing what you can to ensure lifetime care for your pets.